Ladies and gentlemen, my comrades and I are glad to be home. <coughs> For almost two years, we have missed familiar surroundings. All that you have about you here, land, grass, green trees, voices other than our own, the warm rays of the sun, nearly everything that makes life worthwhile. We have at last gotten back, and we are eager to express our thanks to the American public for having made possible our success. Your warm-hearted welcome has meant much to us. Your generous support enabled us properly to equip the expedition. Your good wishes and continued faith in our success sustained us throughout. I want you to feel that we are most grateful. We invaded the bottom of the world for advancement of science and to add to the known areas of the surface of the Earth. The South Polar region are as big as the United States and Mexico combined, and most of it is unknown. And man will not be satisfied until no he knows the globe upon which he lives. As for the definite accomplishments of the expedition, we must leave the verdict to the future and to science. Suffice this to say that by good fortune, we accomplished even more than we set out to do. However, we still have a big task ahead of us, compiling our scientific data. The motion pictures you're about to see reached the United States by fast steamer in advance of our arrival. It was condensed and arranged by Paramount from 30 miles of film. The whole great continent of Antarctica is white and silent and dead. The darkness, the loneliness, and above all, the unavoidable monotony. My men accepted the never failing sense of humor. They accepted every danger and hazard as a matter of course. They had their share of faults, but they held throughout a determination to make the expedition a success, and that they did. And to them goes the credit. So different do valleys become in Antarctica that neither fame nor wealth nor social position counted. Every man had to stand on his feet what he was to the expedition and to his comrades. I was only one of them, and I'm proud of it. I want to particularly emphasize that so different did values become down there that the lowliest job often became the most important. Other expeditions of other countries have endured hardships equal to and surpassing ours. We owe a great debt to them for the knowledge they gave us through the sacrifices they made. I refer particularly to Scott, Shackleton, and Amundsen, who lost their lives in the polar region. By taking advantage of their experiences in modern science, we were helped greatly. But even with these advantages, Exploration in the South Polar region will always be hazardous. It is man against the elements in a primitive state. I am gratified, of course, that we accomplished what we set out to do. But for my part, and above all else, I am grateful that these companions of mine are returning safely to their family without the loss of a man. And for this, I give thanks to Providence.
a tingling moment. It's win or lose now, life or death. The plane rises slowly to circle Little America and square away for the unknown. It soars over, and Dick Bird says that all he could think of were those plucky shipmates left behind who sacrificed two years of their lives to push the quartet over the pole. The small plane is in the air with them and takes this close-up picture. Of course, it can't go to the pole, but feels important as an ambitious escort for a while, like a playful puppy running along as the big dog leaves to answer the call of battle. The escort plane has to leave and takes this last glimpse of the Floyd Bennett speeding gracefully over that desert area of magnetic mystery at the bottom of the world, which has lured so many men to death. Now they're alone, sea birds studying the sun compass, charting his course to keep from wandering like a lost eagle over that featureless expanse of ice. See half a mile below them the crevasses, those frozen furrows of snow and ice, like waves of some giant and ghostly ocean struck motionless by magic. An east wind has sprung up, and Bird lays the nose of his plane 10 degrees to the left. To fly straight south, he must now fly southeast, or head southeast. The magnetic compass is useless. Flying now at a lower altitude to avoid the drift of the wind, they look closer at those ice fissures, which loom larger, like the corrugations of a giant washboard. They measure 50 feet from ridge to ridge. The air is bumpy here. The men crawl over each other in the heavily loaded plane like bees in a hive, each at his task. Bird navigating, Balkan piloting, McKinley surveying, and June making the motion picture record, or taking a turn at the wheel. They are hundreds of miles away from Little America, which now seems quiet and peaceful. The radio operator with receivers clamped to his head strains his ears for messages from that frozen void to the south. He waits for those little dots and dashes from Harold June's wireless key in the plane. Out in the mess room, the rest of the men wait in silence around the long table, their faces framed in anxiety, their lips tense in suspense, 
their ears trained on that loudspeaker through which the radio operator relays to them those same dots and dashes as he receives them. In the plain, the explorers face the test of their lives. The bristling peaks of the Queen Maud Mountains rise up 10 to 15,000 feet before them, like ramparts of frozen rock barring the path. Bird studies the range. The plane is climbing under full power. A ton of gas has been consumed. The plane now weighs 13,000 pounds, but it has to climb over two miles. Now they are approaching the Axel Heiberg Glacier, over 10,000 feet above sea level. The plane is too low. It needs height to get through the mountain walls. The plane struggles. The controls turn loosely in Balkan's hands. Bird knows what that means. The grade is too steep. The overloaded wagon may begin to run back downhill. He sends orders forward to Balkan. In that awful moment of uncertainty when their lives hang on a thread, Balkan reads his instructions. There you see the glacier, right there facing them. Balkan shouts, we must drop 200 pounds immediately or go back. Of course, they could drop gasoline, but if they sacrifice their gas, they fail. Bird decides, overboard with food, food that stands between them and death in case of a forced landing. Down it goes, food that keeps them alive one month. The ship, relieved of weight, rises heroically. She climbs slowly but surely up the glacier. The food is lost on the barren slopes of that frozen, wind-swept ice, but the fuel is saved. Bird has played his ace. If the Antarctic tr trumps that, the game is lost. Hear those motors pulling. Some of that grim look leaves the Viking face of that master pilot, Balkan, as he smiles back over his shoulder and nods. We made it. Oh, boy, what a grand and glorious feeling. Just the way you feel after a reckless driver misses you. And here we are looking right down on top of Queen Maud herself, bald as a doorknob. They must fly 50 miles over those seared, lightless peaks. Of course, landing, landing here means instant death. The whirling blades of their propellers drive them on. At nearly 90 miles an hour, not a beat is missed. The mighty circle of mountains gradually sinks below as they near the great south polar plateau. Bird is relieved, but his face is still serious. They have passed over the dreaded hump, and the pole lies dead ahead. For the first time, man views the south polar plateau from the air. It is a stark expanse of frozen silence that extends for thousands of square miles at an altitude of 10,000 feet above sea level. Looking down over the plane's giant shock absorber, they study the snow-clad tableland beneath them. Looks simple, but if forced to land, it would be impossible to take off again at that altitude with their heavy load. A headwind has reduced their speed. Back in little America, the men still sit in nerve-caught silence. They have sat there for ten hours, listening, listening, always listening. The plane flies into the heart of the polar plateau. Motors purring evenly, smoothly, thanks to the boys who conditioned them. The only worry is, will the gas hold out? Bird is at his instruments, his compass, his sextant, studying intently the sun. The horizon, fate has been kind, the sky is not overcast. If it were, his sextant would be useless, and he would be lost. Carefully and methodically, he marks his findings for every observation. There, they are at the South Pole. The observations click. Spherical geometry proves the calculation. It is 1.25 in the morning of November 29th, 1929. Dick takes out the flag, weighted with a stone from Floyd Bennett's grave. It is the symbol and the monument of the supreme accomplishment. Through the trap door, the flag and stone drop together. There they go, down, down. In this historic moment, Dick Bird watches as this simple token of tenderness and achievement flutters down to rest forever at the very bottom of the world. And then on the back of his paper of calculations, the commander writes the message that carried back to civilization the greatest news item in the world that memorable morning. June at the wireless key taps out the dots and the dashes. Back in the snow-buried huts in Little America, the radio operator sits tense before the control board, waiting with keen ears to pick that historic flash out of the air. Now here it comes, at last the news they have listened for so anxiously. It comes in those same dots and dashes. Oh boy, the news! receive the happy news. That circle of grim silence jumps into life as though each man had been stuck with an electric needle. It was their victory also. Russell Owen of the New York Times, ace of newspaper men, hammers out the news for the eager millions. Bird made it. But back on the plane, the great moment was past. They had actually gone six miles beyond the pole. Bird had wanted to go 50, but feared it might cost their lives. The wind is rising steadily. Clouds are forming behind them. 
Now he and his shipmates face the tremendous problem of getting back over the same course. They must outrun a storm, a single miscalculation, and they will be trapped on the plateau or in the mountains. Remember, they had abandoned 200 pounds of food. Their hope now is in the smooth running of the motors. Their safety depends upon the amount of gasoline remaining in the tanks. It was to conserve this that the food was thrown overboard. Vulcan has been feeding his motors in, on a lean mixture, and sometimes they rebel and cough dangerously. June checks the gas in the tanks and discovers there is just enough to take them to their emergency depot at the foot of the Queen Maud range. All depends upon careful flying and the elements. Bird's careful observations bring them back over the High Bird Glacier, the honeycombed, wind-worn pass out of that wilderness of barren desolation. They are sliding down to the depot where the thirsty motors can be refreshed. Little America waits anxiously while the plane is landed and refueled. The last danger has been cleared. They are in the air again, returning over the furrows and crevasses on their last lap home. The wind is on their tail and they are making over 100 miles an hour. At the base, the men stand out in the sunlit cold, straining their eyes into the southern sky. Bird, keeping a careful log of time and speed, knows he is near home. He keeps constant watch through his field glasses. How close would they hit it? Now in the distance, he spies the object of his search. It is the towers of Little America, which they left 18 hours ago. They have blown 1,600 miles over a waste emptier and more deadly than any ocean. Oh boy, what a welcome sight that is to Dick and his pals. There ahead of them is the place they have called home for almost two years, just a clump of huts buried in the snow, the only speck of civilization on the great Antarctic continent. The men wait there on the ice, and they see it speeding toward them from the south. There it is above them. It's the plane. They point, hats in the air. They hear the motors as it circles overhead. Wow, it's time to celebrate, and how. They don't feel any happier than that quartet in the plane. Bird grips Falcon by the hand, they all share the enthusiasm. It looks as though it is in the bag. And now for the landing. The plane points her nose into the wind and starts out on that glide earthward. Easy on the stick, old scout. Put her down easy, her skis, all three, touch the snow in a flurry. A perfect landing. She's down and safely back. It's over. Up and at him, then. Here she comes, taxiing up to the grandstand. The grand rush now. Oh, for a chance to slap those plucky devils on the back. Here they are, back in the old homestead, back in their own buried hut, safe and sound after thrills and adventures enough to last a lifetime, and the joy of an accomplishment that blew hats off around the world. Here comes the cook with steaming mugs of java. I'll bet that feels good way down inside. And now for the kidding, as they asked the commander how tall the pole was and which way the stripes ran. Vulcan has a frostbite on his lip, but he's not worrying. It could have been a lot worse. I like the modesty of that man, you know. As seafaring men would say, I like the cut of his jib and the human qualities that temper his proven ability as a leader of men. Dick Bird, you are the kind of a bird I like. I'm not talking feathers either. Dick sure has a grip on that spoon. The big jobs are done. Here comes Ghoul and his bunch from the mountains where they did a lot of scientific work and stood by in case of a forced landing. Look at those huskies pull. That's what the ice eaters call mushing. It's been a long pull, but now they're homeward bound. The men watch the approach of the little band that hooked it up to the mountains and back. You know, it takes physique and stamina to stand that grind. At last, all of the parties are reunited. Bird has discovered 220,000 square miles of land and found and named new mountain ranges. The route to the pole has been mapped. A lot of scientific data has been added to knowledge of the Antarctic continent. And not a single man has been lost during all of these months of battle with the elements due to careful and thorough planning and preparations for every activity. Now to get home, back to wives and sweethearts and children. The pack ice has held up the city of New York over a month. At last, the radio operator picks up the captain's welcome message.
Anxiety and fear of being trapped rushes the work of dismantling in readiness for departure. The luggage is loaded on the sleds and drawn to the water's edge. To escape the grip on, of the un, oncoming winter, the men must get their luggage out in a hurry. This temporary camp on the edge of the ice is 12 miles away from Little America. As the temperature goes down, the men await the expected vessel, which is their only hope against another year in the Antarctic, and that would not be so hot. There it is now, a ghost ship, the city of New York, her hull hidden, but her wraith-like spars rising above the low-hanging mist. The men see it and cheer. Here is the means of escape from the ice. Here is the ticket home. The dream ship materializes out of the fog, white and ghost-like, but still the sturdiest little bark in the world. Igloo welcomes her with a quizzical look. That hound needs a tailor mighty bad. On the focusle of the ship, a number of the crew gather to be the first to greet these lost snowmen, for whom they have battled their way through hundreds of miles of floating ice. Every spar and line is caked in solid white. She pulls alongside the bay ice, a regular crystal dock made to order by old man Winter himself, and the lost are found with a hearty exchange of boisterous greetings and stories. Bird was not there to meet the boat. He was back in Little America, last to leave the abandoned camp. I guess we all know how he felt. You know, that little pang that strikes inside during the stirring moments such as this? McKinley gathers the folds of the old flag in his arms and turns the tattered emblem over to the commander. Little America is to be merely a spot on the map, a dead city on a dead continent. Over there in the distance are the two planes. They served him well. Goodbye, old timers. The good ship falling couldn't get through the pack to take them back. And there is one of the sleds that served Goo, left there as a monument on the desolate plain. The ship had to be loaded in six hours, and Captain Melville is about ready to shove off as Bird arrives. Melville did a great job. The bowling crew was eager to come too, but the ship couldn't stand the ice pressure. And look at that armor plating of solid ice, more than 200 tons of ice on her hull and rigging. She had been blown off of her course 300 miles. Looks like that stuff is half a foot thick. That coating gets thicker as more spray and moisture freeze on. What a swell place for a morning bath. Brrr. This stalwart son of the north takes a last look to the south. It's farewell forever. The city of New York heads north, pulls away from that solid cake of ice on the doorstep of the Antarctic and no one left behind. The commander takes one long last look at the land of his glorious adventure and scientific achievement. 